For 116 years, college athletes could not make money off their name, image, or likeness. That all changed in 2021. New state laws and NCAA rules went into effect at 12.01 a.m., allowing collegiate athletes to profit off their name, image, and likeness for the first time. It was the nudge from those states you're seeing on your screen right now that pushed the NCAA to finally offer a one-size-fits-all plan if approved on July 1st. You kind of knew it was coming. It was just a matter of when. Now that, you know, college are able to capitalize off of their name, image, and likeness, they're able to kind of receive a, a portion of what they contribute. For the average student athlete, it didn't change too much unless you were, in my case, Caleb Williams or Spencer Rattler or maybe Jaden Hazelwood with 40, 50, 100,000 followers on Instagram and your following base is strong. It was either an economic rights issue, a civil rights issue, a racial justice issue, and for some, all of those, that it was just unfair that these college athletes were generating so much money, but were not allowed to be compensated for it. So let's dive in. Let's go back to 2010. That's when USC running back Reggie Bush made an unprecedented decision to forfeit the Heisman Trophy. It was in response to allegations that he received improper benefits while at the school. Then, in another violation of NCAA rules, Texas A&M quarterback Johnny Manziel was suspended half a game for allegedly selling autographed jerseys. These two cases, although very different, sparked conversation about whether famous, already celebrity college athletes could make money from that fame. I don't know if it's a change in perception because I think we've always had two sides of the, of the fence, right? You had one side who felt college athletes should be paid, and you had the other side who felt like they shouldn't be paid because that ruins the, the ethics of what college you know, sports is supposed to be. Then. In 2014, a landmark legal decision came in the NCAA vs. O'Bannon case that found banning payments to NCAA athletes violated antitrust law. Part of it was the O'Bannon, but remember in O'Bannon, the Ninth Circuit eventually reversed the NIL decision and said that the NCAA can prohibit NIL compensation because what defines them as amateurs is that they are not paid expenses untethered to education, and NIL was seen as untethered to education. The Ninth Circuit Circuit Court of Appeals ended up reversing part of the decision a year later, but affirmed the part of the ruling that found the NCAA in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. Then, the next landmark legal decision came in 2021. A court case between the NCAA and two college athletes worked its way up to the Supreme Court, which held up rulings from lower courts that found the NCAA in violation of antitrust laws. And in the Alston case more specifically, it was just saying there shouldn't really be any limits on compensation that schools can provide to athletes. And the district court really gave a split decision. They said that the NCAA can restrict benefits that are unrelated to education because restricting those benefits is what separates college athletes from pro athletes, but they're not allowed to restrict benefits related to education. As legal pressure mounted, the D1 Council recommended the NCAA adopt NIL policy. Just a few days later, the NCAA passed interim name, image, and likeness policy. Then a bunch of states passed legislation largely modeled after California's Fair Play to Play Act, which allows athletes to receive endorsements and sponsorships while keeping college eligibility. And more states have NIL policy going into effect in 2023, while some, like Alabama, have repealed their NIL laws. NIL deals began to pour in after the Alston ruling came down in 2021. A University of Miami quarterback got NIL contracts with a moving company and local car dealership. Twin sisters playing basketball at Fresno State were signed by World Wrestling Entertainment in a deal reportedly worth six figures in addition to other NIL contracts. Alabama quarterback Bryce Young reportedly had NIL deals reaching seven figures before even coming off the bench as a backup. Lesser known players have also gotten in on the NIL action. Two University of Oklahoma football players, for example, launched a podcast and have made money from merchandise, sponsorships, and more. Jeremiah Hall was one of them. If anything, I think that we came more together because of it. If somebody had a deal going on, I remember, I think Brian Osamoto had like a pizza deal and we were all like retweeting and, and reposting it. Like, hey, like, yo, plug this in with some pizza. Like you a pizza plug now, you know what I'm saying? So we, we were having some fun. And I remember when, when Spencer got a, got a deal, I think it was with Ford, he got like two cars. We all went on Twitter and uh, we were like, yo, anybody want to want to give a sooner a car? And uh, 
you know, we, we have fun. An NIL deal can be anything from getting paid to sign autographs, working with a local dealership, receiving royalties for jersey sales, or even appearing in video games like the NCAA football series from EA Sports. NIL is definitely not for everybody. It's very similar to any sport where the, where the main position is the person that has the ball most of the time. You know, in, in baseball, it's the pitcher. In, in football, it's the quarterback. In basketball, it's the point guard. It's the person doing the most scoring. Overall, it just gave us more to, to take care of. According to Open Doors data, companies like Barstool Sports, Roback, and GoPuff have all offered NIL deals to college athletes. Lululemon and Unilever have also offered NIL deals. Most of the deals involve sponsored posts on social media, then comes signing memorabilia and other activities and licensing rights, like a potential NCAA game, for example. This integration hasn't been all smooth sailing. In February 2022, the NCAA Division I Board of Directors announced a probe into potential violations from various programs like Oregon and BYU. The formal results are expected this June. At the time, D1 Board Chairman and Georgia President Jerry Moorhead said, We are concerned that some of the activity in the name, image, and likeness space may not only be violating NCAA recruiting rules, particularly those prohibiting booster involvement, but also may be impacting the student-athlete experience negatively in some ways. Alabama's Nick Saban, Mississippi's Lane Kiffin, among others, have spoken out against the current NIL landscape. One area of special concern are collectives. Essentially, marketing agencies designed to facilitate deals between athletes and businesses. A lot of notable alumni and boosters pour money into these organizations, which then goes to the players and potential recruits. However, since NCAA policy prohibits schools from paying players directly, the process is completely legal. There's very little public disclosure regarding collective deals, so the money goes untraceable. How boosters react to player underperformance has yet to be seen. So what's next for college athletics and federal legislation over NIL deals? Uniformity is going to have to be the way that this ends because you can't have different states having different laws on NIL because at that point, once it gets right down to it, again, you go back to the state tax issue. Perhaps those areas and those big schools that are positioned and located in areas that do not have state taxes, they might have the unfair advantage. I think their fear is that this is going to open the door to a series of antitrust lawsuits brought by plaintiffs challenging every restriction on athlete compensation that is unrelated to education or related to education. And that eventually the plaintiffs are going to win so many of these cases that there will be nothing left for the NCAA to be able to control that it will be up to, at best, the individual conferences or, or maybe the schools to decide how much they're gonna pay athletes. And once the door is open to compensation, then there's no way of closing. I think that they should just consult the NFL and look at their policies and how their language is written up and then convert that language to the NCAA and see if they can find a way to come up with an all-inclusive type of system 